Good afternoon, dear audience. Welcome to the Community Hour. Today we have a very special guest with us. It's none other than our own Senator, Honorable Mary Lou McFadden. Senator, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. It's a rainy day, uh, but it's still a lovely day. I am so delighted, uh, dear audience, uh, to have Senator with us this afternoon. And uh, she kindly accepted our request to speak uh, in person in the studio and share her thoughts, her works. And uh, she just traveled from the East. Uh, so uh, once again, thank you so much for taking all the trouble to come here, Senator. Thank you. Uh, the audience of Community Hour uh, today, as I mentioned already, will engage with the Senator and learn more from her works and her activities recently. But before I do so, uh, it's a privilege to uh, have a very uh, brief introduction of the Senator and I'll read her brief bio uh, and uh, just uh, bear with us. Uh, the senator is a human rights lawyer, professor, activist, and appointed as an independent senator in the Parliament of Canada by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in November 2016. Uh, she was one of the most influential leaders of the 1981 Ad Hoc Committee of Canadian Women on the Constitution and Conference, the grassroots social movement of women across Canada, resulting in stronger equality rights in the Constitution. She co-founded several internationally recognized not-profit Canadian organizations such as the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, which is also known as LEAF, the Metropolitan Action Committee on Violence Against Women and Children, also known as METRAC, and the Gerstein Crisis Center for Homeless Discharged Psychiatric Patients. She was the founding principal at University of Winnipeg Global College and has facilitated students across to UN sessions for more than 20 years to provide practical skill by building and providing reporter services to non-government organizations' presentations. Senator is a founding board member of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders and has given extensive voluntary support to civil society organizations that focus on peace building and women's rights, including the Afghan Women's Organization, Canadian Council of Muslim Women, Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, and Manitoba Women for Women of South Sudan. The audience, it is absolutely an honor to have her with us today. Senator, now I would uh, like to start by requesting your reflection, because you were born in Manitoba, and uh, you have spent so many of your years in Manitoba. So what is special about Manitoba? And um, if you just uh, share your thoughts about this uh, special uniqueness of the city itself. Well, you know, I live in Winnipeg now, but the truth is that I was born and raised in rural Manitoba in the small town of Nipawa, Manitoba. And of course, as everyone knows, the license plate for Manitoba says, friendly Manitoba. Um, I'm not sure that's as true when you live in the big city as when you live in a small rural town. And also there's just the reality of you just know many more people when you grow up in a small town as, as I did. I think that one of the most accurate adjectives for people from Manitoba, certainly those that I, I know, and I'm not talking only about my friends, but generally speaking, I would use the adjective resilient. And I would also use the adjective resourceful. And I think that has a lot to do with our rural agricultural context, because even when we live in the city as I do now, it is still very much part of a province that is grounded by the earth, by connection to the earth. And because we have so much fresh water in Manitoba and we have access to the Arctic Ocean, that water is a very strong force in the life of Manitobans. So, I'll stay with those two adjectives of resilient and resourceful. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's such a uh, wonderful reflection. So um, as I know, and as most of us know, 
you spend a lot of time in Ottawa nowadays. Uh, so what do you miss about this province and this city? Well, I find the nature of our life as parliamentarians is that we spend about 80% of our time in and around Ottawa and or on parliamentary duties. And so typically I arrive back in Winnipeg late at night. And typically I leave in the daytime, sometimes very early. And sometimes, like today, I'm actually back home for less than 24 hours. And so the sense of Winnipeg, when I'm here, actually not that often, I, of course, read the Winnipeg Free Press every day. I, I follow a number of our different publications. I follow a number of Winnipeg leaders on social media to get a sense of what's going on. I follow you, <laughs> for example, and you've been the center. And I think that for me, what there are many aspects of Winnipeg and Manitoba that are central to how I see this province and many of the people of this province. And for me, one of the big benefits of that resourceful and resilient nature is that there are people in this city that can always be counted on. They aren't people that stand on ceremony. They're people that work on the issues. They aren't going to immediately start to calculate how they can benefit from something. Typically, their calculation, these community leaders I'm talking about, and I include you in this, are calculating how to bring more strength to our communities. Thank you so much. This is such a wonderful reflection of uh, your thoughts. And uh, as I live in this city, so I had to start with Winnipeg. Switching here now a uh, little bit, Senator, um, I do know that you are here uh, today and particularly you spend some time with one of the Peace Days events uh, with the uh, Sudanese Women Network. So um, could you tell for our audience a bit of uh, the uh, Peace Days and your involvement? Because I, I know you are very passionate about these activities and, and with special focus on the Sudanese Women Network. I'd be very happy to. I, you know, I came here today to sit down with you directly from Government House, from having lunch with our Lieutenant Governor Anita Neville. And I noticed the moment I walked through the door of Government House, there was a poster that emphasized food security. And it's a campaign that the Lieutenant Governor herself has launched. And I thought to myself, this is just another example of what is a marker for many of the leaders in this community, where the focus is on what is needed locally. And, you know, there's a lot of honesty here, too, about the fact that there's a tremendous amount of poverty mm -hmm. and a tremendous amount of disadvantage embedded socially in many of the communities in, in Manitoba and in Winnipeg. And I think it's important as part of our conversation today for me to also acknowledge here we are on Treaty One territory, the homeland of the Métis Nation, and that Winnipeg has the largest urban indigenous population of any city in Canada. And that part of what it means to live in Winnipeg is to acknowledge that a lot of the negative results of the kind of colonialism that has been practiced in Canada from the very beginning, residential schools being but one terrible example, much of the heavy price paid by Indigenous peoples in this country, we can see in our communities here in Winnipeg. But we also see the phenomenal strength and leadership from our Indigenous communities here in Winnipeg. I would say that the, for me, 
particularly the women leaders from the communities, indigenous communities. And when I say indigenous, I include Inu women as well as Métis women, um, as well as First Nations women. I have the great honor and the great pleasure of representing Manitoba in the senator with my sister senator, Mary Jane McCollum, who is Cree, who is Canada's first Indigenous woman dentist, and is now a senator, full of courage, and herself the only senator who is a residential school survivor. So I learned from MJ every single time we're together. And one of the things that I have come to understand much better through watching how MJ does her work as a senator is that it's very important not to place in a category over here on some shelf who we are. That it's the integration of where we came from, what we believe in, and how we're going to live our daily lives in a Manitoba context, a Winnipeg context. And that's something that I've also, a journey, if you will, that I've also had with women leaders from the South Sudanese community. And I'll share with you a little bit about the actual origin of Women for Women South Sudan, which was founded uh, now, we're talking close to 20 years ago. And I have the great privilege of counting as a friend, the current president, Aluk Elizabeth Andrea. Um, and I, I know from the starting days of trying to create an organization of women for women of South Sudan, that it is that negotiation every day from where we come from to where we are today and how to keep that connection, but also how, how to move forward, how not to get stuck. And it was when I was head of global college at University of Winnipeg and many people already know this, but the president of the University of Winnipeg, the Honorable Lloyd Axworthy, who was served for many years as one of our most accomplished foreign ministers at the federal level, and then came back to Winnipeg to head up University of Winnipeg, created Global College, and invited me to be considered to be the dean of Global College, the principal of Global College. When I arrived, I was at the University of Saskatchewan Law School at the time, and, and I was at the Human Rights Commission in Saskatchewan. When I arrived back in Winnipeg, Dr. Axworthy said to me, part of your job as head of Global College is to work with the people here in Winnipeg who've come from South Sudan. And one of the reasons that this was a priority for Dr. Axworthy was that he personally, as foreign minister, was involved in the airlift, the transportation out of Sudan, of what have come to be known as the lost boys and girls of Sudan. Many of those children who were either orphaned or separated from their families, who in many cases walked hundreds of miles to try to find some kind of safety, ended up in some in Minnesota, some here in Winnipeg, and very much facilitated by Dr. Axworthy. And so I right away, uh, when I got here in 2008, I started to meet with representatives of what had come to be known as South Sudan. I think we need to remember that South Sudan is one of our youngest, youngest. countries in the world. And we had a meeting one evening at the University of Winnipeg with a whole collection of people, mostly from the region. And as it finished, I was getting ready to leave and to go home. And a group of women from the meeting asked if they could meet with me separately as women. I said, of course. So we found a quiet spot. And right then and there, they said, what did you notice about this meeting tonight? And I said, well, if you want me to be honest with you, I noticed that none of you had very much to say. 
And they said, well, it's not because we don't have a lot to say. We have a lot to say. But in the way in which our culture, both at home and now at home here in Winnipeg, we are really silenced when we are in a meeting and it is the men from our community that dominate the discussion. I'm summarizing what, what we said. And they said, we want to change that and we want you to help us. And I said, well, I, I'm honored to do that. Of course I will do that. I'm not sure what it is I can do. Well, what ended up happening was, in fact, I found a lawyer to work with the women. I spent time with them in turning their ideas in conversation into legal language that then allowed us to actually incorporate a nonprofit community-based organization that was entitled Women for Women, South Sudan. And right away, we had two primary corporate objectives, because it was a nonprofit, is a nonprofit corporation. One was to focus on women in the community here, women with ties to South Sudan and or origin in South Sudan. But the second fork or the second focus was to try to do what was possible to support women and girls in South Sudan. And one of the reasons that I was so excited about this is that a lot of my research, and now as a senator, a lot of the work that I do internationally is about women, peace, and security. It is built around UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which was adopted by the Security Council at the UN on October 31st of 2000. So we're now into 23 years of this particular resolution. But it's not just one resolution. It, it represents a suite, uh, a cluster of Security Council resolutions that have been made over a period of time from the year 2000 to much more recently. And it's that cluster of resolutions that have a different focus in many steps along the way, all under that umbrella theme of women, peace, and security. And now, much more recently, we have a smaller cluster of Security Council resolutions that focus on youth, peace, and security. And for me, it's the nexus of women, peace and security, youth, peace and security in that UN context that is very important. And at the founding of Women for Women South Sudan, it was clearly an intergenerational organization. We had young women because we had students from the South Sea, the Sudanese community at the university, and we had women, some of whom at that time have since become students at the university, including like a look, the president, uh, like Rebecca Deng, who have graduated and have gone on to leadership roles in our community here in Winnipeg. So as part of peace days in Winnipeg, which I think represent this very important coalition of established organizations like Rotary of, of Winnipeg with former cabinet ministers, lawyer like David Newman, educator like Estelle Lamoureux as just two examples, who have brought together very dedicated community-based volunteers, I think immediately of the lawyers uh, Gary and Darcia sent um, as examples, where you've got younger people, middle-aged people, older people, you have many people who were born in Canada, working directly and closely with people who were not born in Canada, many of whom, in the case of the group that I'm going to be with this evening, are in fact uh, from Sudan, South Sudan. And it is that intergenerational, international mixture that's so important. Dear audience, you are watching Community Hours from You Multicultural. Senator, I was listening very deeply as you explained uh, Women for Women uh, Network and uh, how intergenerational uh, 
women are participating in uh, in the in in propagating their voice in decision making and changes it is so fascinating uh, my next question to you uh, in in a form of understanding uh, your sense of un resolution 1325 and uh, you have told me before the interview that uh, you are heading to new york uh, tomorrow earliest and you're going to speak uh, so what do you see the future of 1325 and what are the challenges of empowering women in, in many of the uh, international uh, arenas? Well, I'll start with the, <clears throat> the worst news, the news that comes out of COVID. Women lost through COVID. We have seen a reversal. We have seen a decline. We have seen huge losses for women all over the world, including Canada, as a result of COVID. We know that for the displacement from employment, that it's women who lost more during COVID, and we know that it's women who are not recovering, regaining. More women are still trying to regain what they lost. Plus, we have seen in these recent years some highly repressive political regimes gain authority, power. They, they maybe d didn't take it democratically, but that doesn't seem to matter, of course, um, because they're essentially anti-democratic. And women do not do well under repressive regimes. It's, it's hard enough within democracies. So all over the world, um, we are seeing that women are not just one step behind, but many steps behind in terms of the opportunities, in terms of resources. And I think as a result of that, what a Security Council resolution can do is, of course, basically up to governments and up to communities. So where we've had this shift away from human rights, away from women's rights. I mean, I'm obviously the gender apartheid regime that's taken over Afghanistan is one of the most dramatic examples, but we've got a lot of examples in a lot of countries where things three, four years ago were better for women than they are now. And resources were greater for women then than they are now. So when you have a whole cluster of Security Council resolutions, and let's bear in mind that a UN resolution is not a law that has any this kind of enforcement that one would see at the community level or even the provincial, the Manitoba level or the national Canada level, that not only are resolutions passed by a majority at the Security Council, but what is happening this weekend, the beginning this weekend, is the UN General Assembly. And most of the resolutions there are by consensus. And they, they don't go ahead until there's a very clear, strong majority. So what that means in practical terms is that things take a long time. And so when we see such a huge setback, one of the points that I'll be making in my speech tomorrow, uh, because I'm at what's called the Sustainable Development Goals Activism Weekend, which is a preparatory weekend, mostly civil society leaders, although I'm on a panel that involves parliamentarians, and the whole idea is to make sure that the sustainable development goals don't get lost in the larger General Assembly uh, agenda that's going to start to roll out on Monday morning. So as we call them side events, uh, become a very important part of any of the large UN gatherings. So here you have 193 state members of the United Nations you have a very small number of countries that sit on the Security Council, and you have 
five countries that can basically stop anything that they choose to. We call them, as you know, the permanent five or the P5. And what we've been seeing at the Security Council in recent years is that it's China or Russia or Russia and China blocking almost everything that is attempted that has a human rights theme. So <clears throat> that makes Security Council resolutions like 1325, which has a very clear focus on women and girls, and you bring in the youth peace and security resolutions, and you also bring in the cluster of children affected by armed conflict. Then you've got three clusters of Security Council resolutions, none of which can be enforced by the UN or any other government. They're very much a matter of the degree of volunteer will. So in practical terms, how, how do people, I mean, the UN Charter begins, we, the people, but only state governments are members of the UN. So that's a very big gap. How do we take those resolutions? And how do we have people actually bringing those resolutions home and using them in effective ways to make changes? And the Women for Women of South Sudan, where I'll be this evening, is one very good example of that, partly because of the two-pronged orientation Let's look at women affiliated with South Sudan in Winnipeg, and let's not forget the women and girls that are still in South Sudan. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that because of your question. Um, not, not tomorrow, but on Monday when I'm in uh, New York, I'm also speaking on a panel that is hosted by UN Women, the agency at the UN, that funds women-specific and girl-specific programming. And it is a, a panel that it consists of women parliamentarians. And I'm, I'm the parliamentarian for Canada that's been invited to speak. But I am sharing the platform with a wonderful woman MP from South Sudan, the Honorable Betty Aguaro who is a former Minister of Agriculture in, in the South, previous South Sudanese government. Betty and I worked together on a whole range of, of women, peace, and security issues. We, we actually have a, quite a lot of fun together. Um, and so we're on the panel. We also have a young parliamentarian from Egypt who's with us on that panel. And we have a young parliamentarian from Kenya who's on that panel. And we're being asked exactly the kinds of questions that you're asking me today about Security Council Resolution 1325. And I plan to use Women for Women South Sudan as one of my examples of the way in which we can take what can be quite abstract in international law, a Security Council resolution, and bring it home, bring it to the community. We have many examples of that. Another very good example is to look at how the community in Winnipeg mobilized around women from Afghanistan, helping them get out, helping them through the period of time while they waited to try and get to Canada, and helping them resettle when we got many of them here in Canada. And I, I, one example that comes to mind um, I had been working, I think you know that um, I, I'm in a bit of trouble uh, in Parliament because I actually conveyed letters that came to me from the Chief of Staff, from the Minister of Defence in those terrible days uh, leading up to the bombing of the airport in, uh, on August 26th of 2021. Those letters have saved hundreds of Afghan women and as a result of that, some of those women that I had, a, a con I was on the phone, on WhatsApp with those women as they were trying to get through the line of soldiers into the airport to try to get out of Afghanistan. And one of those women 
we successfully got to Canada and she sent me a WhatsApp message and said, they're sending me somewhere, my family and I somewhere to a, to a place called Winnipeg. I was like, okay, no problem. Let me promise you this. I wrote back to her and said, I promise you, you know, there will be people waiting for you that are Winnipeggers. So there's a wonderful community that's already mobilized around this and we will be there to help. And I was able to say that partly because of Rotarians, partly because of the Peace Days Network that has allowed many different organizations to come together under this banner of Peace Days. And it means that we're not talking about just September every year. We're talking about all year long. And and so those those were the first calls that I made. And I think that it's not true that it only happens in Winnipeg. I mean, that would be incredibly arrogant of us to claim that. But, you know, I made similar phone calls you know, to other communities when I would hear from a woman that I had helped get out, oh, I just re got this from the government and they're sending me to X or they're sending me to Y. And I wasn't always able to say to them, no problem. I promise you there will be people on the ground and they will be there for you. And I think that is a strong aspect of the community here. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, dear audience, uh, you are uh, watching uh, Community Hour. And I do uh, fondly remember uh, when Senator uh, in the past uh, invited one of the young journalists from Afghanistan, Salsala Nasseri. Salsala. Uh, yeah. And uh, you can find the uh, senator's uh, presence with us in a webinar uh, if you browse through our YouTube channel. And uh, that was a wonderful uh, memory uh, for us as well, Senator, to understand uh, the issues and the problems that uh, Afghan women are facing now, and especially in the midst of so much of uh, uh, turmoil and, and the Taliban takeover. Uh, but uh, we do appreciate Senator's courageous stand on it. And as uh, she rightly mentioned the audience, uh, through her uh, single-handed effort, uh, I, I'm sure hundreds of, of women uh, really uh, found their ways uh, in our beautiful country of Canada. Thank you for doing that, Senator. Well, I just need to say, these kinds of efforts are never single-handed. <laughs> never single-handed. But sometimes a senator can help. And, and that is uh, very humble of her, uh, the audience. And of course, we understand uh, our government is involved. Uh, but uh, I do want to uh, insist that leadership matters, Senator. Mm. Somebody has to lead such an effort. Thank you once again for reflecting on that. Uh, the audience, uh, let me switch uh, gear a little bit here. Uh, now we would like to hear from Senator um, her involvement as Secretary of the Board of Directors of Global Network of Women Peace Builders. And especially uh, if we may ask her uh, to comment on uh, this group's Young Women Leaders for Peace program, helping young women and girls gain the skills and confidence to become community leaders. Senator, uh, if you can also give us some idea uh, how you are helping these young women to become future leaders. Well, <clears throat> it's my great pleasure and my great honor to serve on the board of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. It is headquartered in New York, directly across the street from the United Nations headquarters, and a great deal of the work happens inside the UN system. And it is work, though, that is always, always grounded by the local leadership of women and girls in their communities in conflict zones or post-conflict zones coming freshly out. So Colombia would be an example of that. And Security Council Resolution 1325, that whole cluster, plus the Youth Peace and Security cluster of Security Council resolutions, plus the Children Affected by Armed Conflict cluster, <clears throat> they are the basis, the guiding documents, the guiding international law 
of the work that is done by the global network of women peace builders. And that's a, a long-winded name, but every word of those four words is very important. Global, network, so no single group, no, no single, if you will, elite, small membership, but, but a network, and women, and peace builders. And, and that means that really, I, I can say because it's much more the staff than the board of, of, the, of the GNWP, but it is the leading organization on bringing together women peace and security and youth peace and security. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yet, as a result of that, the basic guiding principle of the GNWP is for that very small staff based in New York to be out in communities, in countries that are in the midst of a conflict or are trying to get out of a conflict and, and rebuild, and to position the women leaders who are already leading. They're on the front lines, they've been on the front lines, they know their communities, they know their country, and it's getting them to the negotiating tables. It's getting them before local and uh, state governments to make sure that women's expertise and women's knowledge is there and is taken into consideration. And for many people, that would be a no-brainer, right? From would be like, of course, I mean, Pretty much every country in the world has at least 50% of the population women. And of course, that's what you would need. But it's not what happens in reality. And it's much more the practice is to exclude women or to diminish the role that they play. So there's a lot of sophisticated advocacy that goes into bringing women who are already leaders. This is no favor that's being done for women. This is about leaders who understand their communities, who will be able to help to develop peace building plans that are actually going to work. And we have research on this. It is very clear from academic research that where you have peace plans for post-conflict resilience that where you've involved women, where as a result you get much more of an investment in the health and the education and the opportunities for even poor members of a society, you have a more successful peace agreement. They last longer. Some of them have, have never been broken. Uh, we're in a very turbulent time again with South Sudan. You know, we're going to hear more about that tonight. It's not that the international law is the solution. It is that it's an important tool for those that have invested everything that they are and that they have in trying to bring peace back to their communities and to bring an inclusive peace, a fair peace. And the other thing that research shows us is that where you have economic inclusion of women as a result of peace agreements, you have greater productivity. The whole country benefits more. So really what, what women are battling more than anything else is prejudice. Prejudice that is not actually grounded in the reality of what are the best results for a culture, for a community, for a country. And that is really at the heart of what the Global Network of Women Peace Builders does every day. Support the women who are already leaders and open up avenues for their expertise to be brought to the table and to the implementation process so that the kind of peace that gets built is an economically productive and inclusive peace. And this is so fascinating, Senator, because 
uh, the way you defined peace, sustainable peace, and with integration of economy uh, with women, and my particular study uh, in Northern Ireland conflict, and as a UN peacekeeper, uh, I was in uh, Western Sahara, and I do testify with your comments that this is what uh, make a difference in terms of peace. And, and I have seen personally, uh, because I was uh, also uh, in conversation with Dr. Muhammad Yunus and his microgrid program, and I think this is all uh, fall into the same category that when we empower women in decision making, that, that really brings uh, sustainable change in the society. Uh, dear audience, uh, uh, you are watching uh, us in uh, conversation with uh, our Senator Mary Lou McFadden and uh, we are in Community Hour. Senator, uh, I am at the last part of our conversation today, but before I leave, I am also very interested in one of your tweets which you recently uh, did and uh, it says that you are also involved as a co-chair with a member of parliament, Dr. Hedy Fry yes. of the House of Commons and it is about Canadian Association of Parliamentarians for Population and Development. What are the challenges and opportunities on this front? Thank you very much for that question. And I don't know how many of our audience members know Dr. Hetty Fry, but I, I just have to tell you, she is truly a force of nature. <laughs> she is 83 years old, and she is the longest serving member of parliament in our parliament currently. She is the parliamentarian who defeated a prime minister. It was Prime Minister Kim Campbell who held her riding in Vancouver. And uh, it was Dr. Hetty Fry that took that riding and has represented that riding ever since. And uh, she, she was a family doctor in British Columbia. And um, she asked me to co-chair what we call the CAPPD. And uh, it's, we've done that together now for a number of years. And really, although it has that very long title, what our association is about is to bring together parliamentarians in the Parliament of Canada across all lines, if possible, to focus and to focus on women's and men's reproductive health and reproductive choice in their health. And we work very closely with the UN Agency um, for Population and Development and one of the guiding documents, which is how we get that long title for our, our organization name, is in fact the uh, platform on population and development that came out of the Cairo conference some, some time ago. And what it boils down to is that what we try to do as parliamentarians is to work in partnership with civil society and to find ways to build awareness and also engagement in reproductive choice and reproductive health. And yes, we, it is an organization that strongly supports the choice to have an abortion, a woman's choice to choose. It is bigger than that. It is also about the health of LGBTQ2SI, young people and people of all ages. It is really um, part of what you see in the, in the UN platform on population and development, that it is the kind of universal health care that we need to be seeing in every country in the world. It's a very big push of, of the UN, one of the major themes of the UN in the last number of years. And so we try to have Canadian parliamentarians participate in international meetings, but we also work locally and uh, have this network across the country of organizations that are focused on reproductive health and reproductive choice. Uh, that's such a wonderful uh, approach of uh, addressing uh, uh, these are, the, uh, I, I would say, very important uh, aspects in our social political life. Senator, um, we are um, going to end our conversation, but uh, before I actually leave you, my <laughs> last question would be, uh, it's a very general question. I always um, ask a uh, uh, you know, person of uh, your stature that what are your hopes and fears for the future? What do you see in general our country uh, with regards to, because your area of focus mostly 
in your life was women, empowering women, uh, facilitating women uh, in, in various spheres of life. What do you see the future? Uh, and, and if you share with our audience your hopes and fears. Well, actually, one of my biggest fears is about fear. It's about fear-based politics. And I think it's really important for me to say to you, this is not about a political party. I'm an independent, I'm a truly independent senator. I don't belong to any of the political groups within the Senate itself, and I don't belong to any political party. I contribute as a Canadian citizen, I donate money to a whole range of the political parties in this country because I believe they make up our democracy. And I'm, I'm afraid of the fear-based politics that have taken hold in our country to a very significant degree. I'm afraid of what I think is a democracy for our country that is weakening, not strengthening. I see, I'm afraid because of the fact that we see a decline in voter turnout and voter participation. It's one of the reasons that my top priority for my parliamentary agenda is my bill. Currently, it's S-201, and it's generally called the Vote 16 Act, which is to lower the federal voting age to 16 so that we can introduce a couple of million new voters into our democracy. And voters that are young enough and educated enough that they are engaged at a young age in our democracy and develop at a younger age than 18 a commitment to vote, to pay attention to vote, and all that comes with that on every day, not just on the day that you go to cast a ballot. And I, I don't I don't know whether my bill will, will be successful, but every time we have a session of Parliament, I introduce my bill again. And I'll just keep doing that for as long as I'm able to. And as a result of my concerns for our democracy, I, 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 I can't actually find the words to adequately express how important community leadership is in addressing the concerns. Because what we saw, and I was in Ottawa uh, for the much of the convoy, the time that, that the convoy took over the city, I saw what happened on the streets of Ottawa. I, I know that there are many sympathizers for the convoy thinking, here in Manitoba, I am very concerned that on one hand we have to respect freedom of expression. It's, a, it's protected in our Constitution. On the other hand, we have to have balance. We cannot allow a situation where the freedom enjoyed by certain people who may choose to dominate in a whole bunch of different ways, the honking of horns just being one way, we cannot allow that to take away everybody else's freedom. That's not a democracy. That's deeply anti-democratic. And so I think that we are actively engaged right now. We're actively struggling in this country right now about what it actually means to be in a democracy that is a constitutional democracy where you have a charter of rights and freedoms, but you have very different opinions about my right, your freedom, where is the balance? And I think that young people must be included in this whole process that we're undergoing right now. Thank you so much. Dear audience, uh, we would like to end our conversation because Senator has important things to attend this evening and uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, dear audience, I would only uh, leave you with the thoughts that uh, Senator is an embodiment of true spirit. 
and as she rightly mentioned, she is independent. And uh, her couple of uh, thoughts at the end of our conversation today are also very important about the democracy, about the way she thinks that we have to be aware of restoring or safeguarding our democracy in this country. And uh, with these humble thoughts, uh, let me once again thank our senator uh, who spent almost an hour plus with us. And we have learned so many things from you, Senator, this uh, afternoon. And I'm sure our audience and especially the young generation, those who are going to watch this uh, particular conversation, would be particularly inspired uh, through the spirit of our own senator. Thank you once again for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. It's always a pleasure to speak with you.